is a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Holly Bryant of BryantConsultants.com. How are you doing today, Holly? I'm doing great. How about you, Howard? How's the great state of Tennessee doing? It's awesome. Bleeding orange, you know. Yeah. I, holes. I, uh, I, I, I love Nashville. There's a, the, uh, the original music in the United States, you only find it in three cities. It's uh, New Orleans on Bourbon Street. It's um, Memphis on Bill Street. And in Nashville, what is it called? Sec is it Second Street or Second Avenue? I'd, I'd call it Broadway. We call it Nash Vegas. Not Nash Vegas? <laughs> it, it is, though. I mean, even if you're not a country music fan, when you're seeing those young people trying to break out in that scene and you're watching it live, it's kind of like when you're in Bill Street, everybody's favorite music is jazz. And when you're in, uh, when you're in Nashville, everyone's favorite music is country music. Uh, even if you're not a country music fan. And I mean, it's just amazing. I've seen some of the most amazing bands in those three cities in my whole life. So Holly Bryant is a speaker, writer, coach, and off-site team member for many practices across the United States. Holly has over a decade and a half advanced training in TMD, myofunctional therapy, sleep, cosmetic, and implant services. Holly's education, management experience, and clinical skills have allowed her to provide a modernized spin to the traditional consulting services. Holly worked for some of the heavy hitters in dentistry, Dr. Ross Nash, Dr. Jeff Blank, to Dr. De Brad Durham, and their management styles and exceptionally high standards created a solid foundation that is now reflected in her daily work. Holly made a lot of doctors and their practices and education facilities a lot of money. And then one day she took the leap on her own and Bryant Consultants was created. She loaded up her condo in Savannah, Georgia, and moved back to her small town in Kingsport, Tennessee, where she grew her consulting business in the basement of her parents' house. Holly is involved in a ton of organizations, the AAPMD, IAPA, AACD, AADOM, AADA, TDA, ADMC. Holly is a mom of her daughter, Scarlett, who is almost four, and her husband, who runs them both and manages the entire Bryant Consultants Company, which is also a marketing company for business across the U.S. Holly, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. I'm having. I'm. I'm happy to be here. My last day of vacation, and we'll end it with you, Howard. Right on. So, when you left Savannah, Georgia, who were you uh, working for in Savannah? Was that Ross? That was uh, Brad Durham. That's the. He runs the niche uh, seminar business, and they do like facelift dentures, and they do the whole courses on um, how to make your practice uh, a small niche and do what you love. Well, you will you do. do me a favor, email email him and cc me, Howard, at dentaltown.com and tell him I want to bring him on the show. Sure. I've yeah. done Ross Nash's uh, wife, but Deborah, on a podcast, but not Ross, and I haven't done Jeff Blank either. So send them emails. I will. He's a crazy bird, but man. Well, they... I, like, I like those real world guys. You know what I mean? I mean, if you can make it in the country, if you can make it in South Carolina, if you can make it in Georgia, it'll apply anywhere. But a lot of the stuff that comes out of, you know, Manhattan and Beverly Hills is more niche market. And when you look at the 211,000 people alive in the United States with a dental degree, most of them don't live in a fancy area. Most of them live in what I call middle America. You're right. That's the, that's the clientele that I like or the, the guys in the woods that uh, they're doing it right by their community and they're, they've got a good name and they are, um, they're cutting beautiful teeth and, and getting people healthy. That's my thing, but small town, going big, and just um, making it. I love it. Real so, world people. So your website is Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T, consultants.com. Um, you're talking to thousands and thousands of dentists right now. Um, who are your perfect clients, and what are they not seeing, and what are you helping them do? I, how, uh, what, what, what is the average state of condition of a dentist calling you? Um, why are they calling you and what are you doing for them? And it's obviously working because you're uh, basically uh, crushing it in referrals. So, so what, what's, the, what's the diagnosis and treatment plan of a typical dentist calling you and what are you doing for them? My clients are basically referral-based. So they hear from one of their friends that it works, that this whole, bar, this whole consulting thing works that she's different and she's not going to come in there with a cookbook and throw it all on you and just make you go at it. Uh, my, my best clients are ones by referral. The typical one, they're in that million dollar range and they're stuck. How do I get over the hump? How do I go further? And how I have no more hours in the day. So 
So I've got to do it, but I've got to do it differently. And see, that's the thing I keep berating. And I, and I know a lot of people say you repeat yourself, but I'm going to repeat this on every con- podcast I do is that the average dentist does 700 and takes home uh, uh, 174. Whenever right. you talk to a consultant, their average client does a million. Hello, guess why they're doing a million? Because they use consultants while you use all your money buying shiny objects like lasers and CBCTs <laughs> and CAD cams and learning how to place implants because you think all those silver bullets are going to get you there. And everyone I know, I don't know one dentist doing 2 to $4 million a year who's my age at 53 that hasn't used a half dozen different consultants in their lifetime. Well, when you think about it, you know, a consultant is a coach. You know that. I mean, we hear this crazy stuff. Tiger Woods, you know, he's got seven of them. You hear these uh, larger dentist corporations that have five, six, seven. Every department has a coach because they want to make it. And they're realizing that if I want to go and I want to do it right, maybe I can't do it right on my own. Maybe I want some help. Maybe I want some expertise. Maybe I want to hear from what other people have been doing and screwed it all up. And I bring what everybody's already screwed up or what I've personally screwed up to the table. And, and then we're going, we're going money. People want to make money. Time and money, that's all you got, right? I want to hire a nutrition uh, coach, but I can't get one to endorse a Domino's pizza pasta bowl. Bad diet. Bad I di- mean, it's bread filled with pasta with cheese on top. If, if you can't see the genius in that, I don't know what, uh, how could you be a nutritionist? So... So what are so what so when these people calling you up doing a million dollars a year and they're stuck why why do you think they're stuck what what are you doing to unstuck them? Um, I will tell you it's like a it, it, I guess my analogy is it's a marriage and marriages either stay exciting and adventurous or they get stale and old. So pick one. Where are we going? And when you think about the practice, if you've allowed yourself or your team to get kind of stale and stuck and they lose that adventure and that excitement, then, um, then you lose your momentum because we're growing on momentum and we're also growing on team members, putting the right people around you that do it well each day or want to do it well and you're willing to teach them. I love the hungry people. And you imagine the stories that come out of a dental practice every day and the new and the excitement that comes from that chair every day. There's a whack jack, a story (laughs) coming out of that chair every day. How could you lose your luster and the the excitement when it's something new every day? But, you know, that's driven by the, that's driven by management. It's driven by the doctor. It's also driven by the team. So a lot of my stuff is team work. It's not the rah, rah, bull crap. It's more of Let's get down and dirty and figure out what you want to do with your life. What do you want to do here? How do you want to go? How do you want to roll? And how far do you want to go? So, so, what, do you, so what do you think? Uh, so what's getting dentists excited these days? I mean, I like the shiny object toys if it, if it sparks. I mean, if, if going to an institute, if buying a laser, if, if something flips your flipper so you're back to exciting again, then you can't afford not to have it for mental health reasons which will transform to driving your business. How, how, do, how do you get teams fired up? Well, same thing with a team member. Isn't there a, a shiny object that gives them luster and gets them re-engaged, a new, a new product, a new uh, technique? But the hard part is n- not having access to that. A lot of doctors, they go for the shiny object and they buy to keep themselves on fire, but then they forget. What about these people who help me make money every day what about those shiny objects or what about those things that give them luster? So we bring in um, first figuring out what, what it's got at, what's it going to take to go the distance? Because as a dentist, what's it going to take to go 20 more? There's something in there that's going to take you to go 20 more. Well, hygienist, how are they going to sit and do the same dang thing every day for the next 20 years? You got to build some stuff in there. Got to have some fun with it. And it can't be pick and plaque every day. Assistance, it can't be sitting there sucking the spit every day. There has to be more. So we figure out what the more is. And a lot of times the more is a little bit of that freedom to engage patients and talk to them. And half the time, teamers don't even know how to talk to them, how to sit there and have a conversation with a patient about the patient, about what they need, and how to turn that into revenue. I mean, gosh, you know this. Doctor gets up out of the chair. Team, you know, patient looks at team member and goes, really? I got to get this. 
and I either engage or I disengage. And team members don't realize what that is oftentimes. Some do, there's some superstars out there, but then others, the majority of people, eh, they're there to get that paycheck. So we gotta turn that paycheck into, let's, uh, let's make bank, let's do it right. Healthcare and government employs the most entitled employees in America. I mean, you know, go to a restaurant or a bar if you want to see someone hustling and engaging and communicating oh. and, and running for this and that. Then go to any hospital, any dental office. I mean, the only place in where I live in Ahwatukee where you got to stand in line is at the government, the DMV, the doctor's office. You, you, go, you go check into any doctor's office in, in Phoenix, and it, they got the, the glass wall. Wow. You sign in, maybe and you knock hole. on what? Me. And the little hole. Excuse me, can I get some help? I, I know. And it's just like and and at, and at twelve o'clock they're all going to lunch. It wouldn't matter if the waiting room was filled with a bunch of people having a heart attack. And at five o'clock they're all going home. They don't even know if they made money for the day. They don't even know what their break even point was for the day. I mean it's it's gotten so bad that now in America you can't even sell a physician's practice. Because it's all Medicaid, it's all Medicare, it's all Obamacare. Anybody opens up their door, you can't get in for you know several weeks. So there's nothing to sell in a dental and in, in a medical office. So how so so how do you get these? Uh, and and they all get a raise every time the Earth goes around the sun. And then they want to know why their labor is thirty percent. So how do you? What, what do you actually do? Because my homies are listening. You saying, okay, so what are you going to do? If I go to BrianConsultants.com, do I? How much money do I give you? Do you fly down or is this all over the phone? Do you set up an interview with my hygienist, my assistant, my receptionist, the spouse? What, how do you do a diagnosis and treatment plan? Uh, diagnosis and treatment plan. Number one, uh, a lot of it starts with just a conversation with the doctor because I got to find out if you're engaged or not engaged or if you've got a fire because a lot of times if this is a fire and you've called me because I'm in your last ditch effort, then we're going to have a big problem because I you're, I got to find out where you stopped working for yourself. For me, um, I work as hard as a doctor will work. Uh, I'll put into it as much as he'll put into it. So if he wants to put in, you know, 30 hours a week on this project, I'll, I'll do the same. I will, I'm a workhorse. Um, time. So we, we, we do the doctor thing. We have a conversation. They fill out a couple forms for me so I can understand personalities, so I can understand what their ambition and goals are, so we can figure out if we can mesh and do it. Um, everything's month to month. I don't do contracts. I do commitments because I want to fire your ass if you fire me, you know, if you're not going to work hard for your business. I want that privilege. I want that opportunity, but I want you to have that opportunity as well because when you feel tied down to something and overly committed, then sometimes um, that in itself is enabling. So that's just my style. I spend a lot of time with the team because I want to know what drives them. I make them fill out some survey stuff too, not cheesy ones. I want to know to the heart of it. And, um, you know, if money's driving their boat, I want to help them make more money. And it takes a time. It is not something that you roll in there and everybody gets a raise. I don't believe in merit raises. Everything's based on performance with me. Um, I, I track things. I get doctors to track things. I use stuff like dental intel or I use tracking forms that, um, that are digital that uh, they report in on so we can track numbers and success. But number one's accountability for me. So if a doctor engages and says, let's do this thing, I go into the practice, I spend three days, and then basically I spend about two days every other month in a practice. So uh, in order for me to take on more clients, what I do is I have to be making my doctors lots of money so I can graduate them to another level and then bring in new people. And I got a couple team members that work with me that uh, they bring in clients and then they go through the same process. But uh, I want to give doctors the biggest bang for their buck. And a lot of times it's teaching them those skill sets. It's teaching the team members. And then it's creating a digital accountability, even long term training, creating stuff that, you know, used to it used to be a SOP manual. Now we're digital. So recording little videos and YouTubes and stuff so that we can put it out there and keep training our own team members because we know teams change and turn, but um, that's, that's pretty much me is uh, bring them in, find out what the right client is uh, that for, works with me. I'm, I'm a little aggressive and uh, brash and harsh and I have no filter some days. So uh, I want this same for my doctor. 
and that way we're not going to hurt each other's feelings. If we do, we'll say it, then we'll get over it, and um, and, and that works best. But I want somebody who will put into it as uh, and and want to grow their pra practice. That's hungry. So is you've there, been around there's everywhere. Don't you like the hungry ones? So is there what's a what's the starter package cost to get you to come down there for three days and and uh, and and evaluate this? Three days of me, just me. I know, uh, but what, is, what does that cost? $3,900. $3,900. And when you go in there, is it like the first day you're a fly on the wall and you just want to see what they do in their own environment? Or t t t t Tell me how you did do this over three days. So, first day I'm in there and, and I just want to see and observe and everybody is on their best behavior. That's why it's three days because the first day it is people are on their very best behavior. They just are like the consultant, oh, geez, we got to hurry and be nice, look good, so the doctor can get rid of her. So I've spent some time doing my homework on these girls and, and guys, and uh, we engage in conversation. And then first day, I do lunch with them. I just want to get the wall down and have conversation. Uh, day two, I do the lunch. I, we do like a two-and-a-half-hour lunch, spend some time with the whole group, the doctor, talk about some of their goals, and then and we've worked on a few personal systems that that people have had hang-ups on or they feel like they need clarification on. Come day three, we do a full day training. We do shut the practice down or we do it on a Friday or a Saturday so we don't lose production. And uh, for me, that's the jump start. That's, that's how the sweet stuff starts is I've got to jump start your practice and show you that you can make some money. So we pick one or two things that just absolutely will make you a ton of money pretty quick. And then uh, I support them for the next couple months to make sure that uh, we c they're doing it that I can live up to what um, I said that I could do for them, that they can live up to that commitment of what they want to do for their self. And then at that point, it's kind of, uh, sometimes that's enough for a doctor is he's like, wow, you gave me enough. I'm going to work on that. Other no, no. times they, they are like, let's go now. And we just get on going. So on those, uh, what, like, are one or two things, are those different for every office or is there some Every office is different. My big, my common one that I will tell you about is um, common is shutting the freaking back door. So whether that's, that's with existing patients, uh, really engaging. Every doctor just keeps going, my new patients, my new patients, my new patients. And when I get them to see that it is cheaper to work on your back door and keeping your existing patients than it is, obviously you want new patients, but you got to shut the door. Because if they're flying out the back door, they're only new once, you've got a whole other range of problems. So we end up working on um, the normal one, photography, printing pictures, putting them up on the screen, using them to engage patients, team members, not doctors, uh, and having conversations. That's a pretty big one. Um, or we work on our recall and how to create that system uh, in a modern day need that works with that practice and that demographic so we can shut the door because um it sucks when your patients are they're coming in for a new patient or they're coming in once or twice and no one's calling and checking on them and then before you know it they're not new anymore and how do we know you care so relationships are pretty big that's like number one in my book and uh those things happen through pictures they happen through recall or treatment and follow-up what type of recall system? That's a very common system. Do you like pre-appointing the, the patient after cleaning six months in advance? Some people have them fill out a postcard that they'll drop a mail two weeks ahead of time. Some call the night before. You know what? Any, any recall system that everything, you like? Heck yeah. Everything that I do is, um, it, I call it the trifecta. It's the triangle. Everything I teach is in some form of a triangle. Why? I don't know, but it works. But for me, it's, it's, it's always going to be a phone call. Always, always, always. Yes, I pre-appoint, um, but I pre-appoint with not a do you uh, want to make this appointment. It's here's your appointment. Here's how important your appointment is. And Miss Jones, you'll get a nice courtesy reminder of this date. Not we'll call to confirm. None of that crap. Uh, so we got phone call. I do send a postcard because the demographics that I work with all over the country, uh, they, they grew up on a postcard. Sorry, if they grew up on a postcard and that's what I'm used to, then when you stop giving me a postcard, you stop caring. So I do postcard and we do smile reminder or demand force or lighthouse, some kind of automotive. 
Let, let's talk about that. In the beginning, you said <clears throat> you like digital accountability. Um, you said you like uh, dental intel. Uh, what, 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 what do you, why do you like dental intel? What is that, like 500 a month? Uh, I think they have different packages, different, different package. plans. For me, I like, um, I started off with, and I still use, an in-office tracking board because I want everybody when they're eating their lunch to see their numbers, and I think that's critical. Is that like a whiteboard, a grease and, board? Oh, yeah, big old whiteboard, and we track it. We track every department. We track K6S because if, if I don't know what I am expected to put into it, how will I, how will I know what you want from me? How I know where my goal is because we have practice goals, but then we also have individual performance goals because I have to perform to get paid. So if you want to make money, you got to put it out there every day. So we track individual performance. Um, and then uh, I used I, some offices, they're like, man, I'm not buying another, another add-on product. I'm not buying another thing. So then we have... Um, they have a dashboard that they fill out online that comes directly to me and we go that direction. But for some of the offices that are a little bit more uh, involved, a little bit more, let's go at it full throttle, I'll use something like Dental Intel because it, it gives everybody on the team an email every morning with a ranking of where we're at, what we're doing, what, how I did yesterday. It's a great performance measuring mechanism. Um, I think there's going to be a big price war with some of that stuff coming up. There's a lot of companies out there trying to invent, trying to create. Um, Who are those they, companies? Um, I think uh, Backbone is one of them. Backbone? Uh, Backbone. Um, they Backbone? have Backbone, Dental. They actually have this company called Blue IQ. Uh, Backbone was used in chiropractic for years. And I know a little bit about chiropractic care, too. Why is that? <laughs> Cause I can fix anything, buddy. I fixed an immigration attorney practice and flipped it and made her a million in six months. Nice. <laughs> so if you need some immigration advice, I'm good at that. And then uh, chiropractic, uh, chiropractic is very close to dental. So it, it's really, uh, you know, I've done bug groups. I've done all kinds of stuff. It's really about motivating people to want to do their very best and engaging them. So when's, uh, when's, uh, um, what would you call it? Blue IQ. Uh, when, when's that, uh, coming out? Uh, I, 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 I've, I've seen it. I hear the rumors and I know they've got some, uh, test clients running. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where are they out of? Utah. Oh, I, so is it related to the, the dental intels out of Utah? Yep. Utah is like the Mecca of dentistry. It started with Gordon Christian, um, uh, uh, Dick <laughs> Barnes of, uh, of, smile uh, reminders out there, you name it. They're smile all smile makers out there. Yep, smile reminders right down the street. Smile reminders down the street from where? From uh, from Dental Intel, from uh, Backbone. I think they're all like. Is Backbone and and Blue IQ the same thing? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's owned by Backbone, but it, the the name of the product is called Blue IQ. And I think uh, a Weave is out there too. Yeah, Weave. My gosh, uh, Dick Barnes of uh, Bar. What, what's it? Arrowhead Dental Laboratory? Um, gosh darn, uh, uh, Ultra Dead. You know, up. Dan we, Fisher. Oh, we gotta go to Utah. Oh yeah, and uh, and you know what? And uh, Utah has the lowest average income for dentists of all fifty states. Come on. No, they they do. There's a dentist on every corner, and why they opened up a couple of dental schools is completely insane. But yeah, when you travel around and lecture to dental schools, about 10% of all the classes are from Utah. Wow. It's just uh, some cultural thing where they just love dentistry, medicine, law. I mean, really. I mean, they, uh, I, I think they all decide at age three they're going to be a dentist, a physician, or a lawyer. I think it's the fresh air. Yeah, amazing. So, but, so, <laughs> but, so back to, uh, uh, we'll, we'll go through these other ones. Um, it, uh, dental Intel. Um, you said there's a, one coming out, Blue IQ. Um, what do you like about dental intel? Do, do you think practices just do a lot better by giving dental in, getting a daily email and, and metrics and accountability? I don't think practices do well. I think team members do well. There's a difference. When the doctor get it, gets it, nothing, I love you guys, but nothing's really done with it unless you're complete. I mean, you got a ton of crap on your plate. I got to be, I got to do the bills and I got to take care of the family and I got to take care of 10 ladies at work. 
and then I've got 50 patients a day to take care of, you're laying hands on way so too many people. So when it's all on your plate, no, it doesn't work. When, it's a, when the team is logged in, plugged in, and they're all getting that intel every day, how can you not be accountable? That's like a fitness program. You know, if somebody's not on your case daily and making you aware of what's going on and what you're eating, it's like wearing a Fitbit. I mean, you are constantly getting the intel saying, what about, what about, how are you doing? How are you feeling about this? Look at her numbers, look at your numbers. You're, you're, you're playing the game. I mean, for me, it's about knowing the score. I mean, I, I've worked in retail and coming from a retail, we knew the sto score about everything. Our department versus somebody else's, us against 50 other stores. So taking that same philosophy, knowing your score makes you, man, if I want to go get a raise, I can go to my doctor and say, look at this. Look at my case acceptance ratio. Hey, look at this. Look at my reappoint ratio. That's, that's crucial. And I don't care how you track that, but knowing the score daily and being completely engaged, that's business. And we want everybody to be a business owner in their mindset. So what, what uh, metrics do you like uh, Dental Intel to be tracking for your clients? You said case acceptance, reappoint rate. What, what, what are the main barometers that you like to track? And, and so, you said, go ahead. No, if you think about reappointment ratio, I mean, everybody says, oh, I reappointed them. Oh, we reappointed You're them. You're talking about hygiene only? Yeah, hygiene and doctor. Oh, reappointed them. But did they really get reappointed? How do you personally know that as a dentist that that patient reappointed? Either you're an OCD dentist and you're checking every single patient to make them sure they get reappointed or you're looking for some kind of tracking mechanism that will show you that that person reappointed. That this is the average amount of money we made off and of that. And what should the reappointment ratio be? If my homie's listening to you, I what, want, what is average? What, what, what is an A, a B, a C, a D, and an F in reappointing? For me, I'm going to tell you that if you're, I want 100% in my hygiene department. 100% because, hygiene. But if they're my patient, you tell me this. If you've got a patient in your office and they've been in your office, what would prevent them from reappointing six freaking months from now? Four months from now for their perio. If they want to be there, why wouldn't you want to reappoint? I mean, that's, that's crazy in my book. Why wouldn't you get 100%? People say, oh, but people have stuff going on. You got six freaking months from now. What do you got going on? So, so for me, I want 100%. I want to go every day. And you know what? I know I'm not going to get it. Because you're going to have those people who are, oh, I'm leaving. Oh, I don't know about this. I don't know where I'm going to be. Hey, then I'll be happy with 90. Give me 90. But I want, I want the attempt every day. I guess in most, in other dental consultant worlds, they're happy with 70. But I want to know where that other 30 is going. That's why I want, I, I, I'm a goal setter. I want, I want 100%. Um, what else? In my recare or in my normal restorative, I mean, you tell me what case acceptance is good. I know in my head and what I'm pushing my teams to do is I want to get 75% or above. Okay, well, the national average is 38%. If, if, you, if you look at dental insurance companies, for every 100 cavities you diagnose, 38 out of 100 get drilled, filled, and billed. You and I have seen the deal where it's a medical dental billing. There's two dental offices, the same size, same number of patients, and one does twice as much as the other because one's case acceptance is 38% or a third. What do you think the difference is? Well, well, I, I want to get to that. It, obviously, it's, it's leadership or lack thereof. And so I want to, I want to ask you this. Um, some, some dentists say they don't believe in office managers. They want to be the leader. Maybe they're hardwired for that. Maybe they're natural born leaders or, or maybe they're um, not. Some say, you know what? I'm going to get me an office manager. I just want to fix teeth. I, I, I really don't want to do all this stuff. I don't want to deal with dental intel and dental consultants. I'm going to get office manager. Some also say, no, I, the office manager, it's too much money to justify their fee. Uh, you got two assistants. One of them is going to run the back office and you got two girls up front and one of them is going to be in charge of the front office. What, what business model do you like? I mean, do you think the dental office should, the dentist should run the show? Or you, do you see more success with the office manager? Or do you see more success with no office manager? 
and one dental assistant running the other assistants and hygienists and one of the receptions up front running the whole front office. Howard, I'm going to tell you right now that I will, I will honestly tell you it's personality. It goes down to me with personality. If I've got a dentist that is, you know, he's the uh, real laid back. I want everybody to be happy. Let's please them all. Mm, not a good showrunner because now he's going to try to make everybody on his team happy all the time. There's going to be a hundred rules that have been broken. No one has the same, uh, no one has the same anything. So we create a whole bunch of inconsistency. So that practice, yeah, I want some, I want a leader in there. I want a manager. For and, a would that, and would that be one office manager running the whole office? Or, yeah. do, or do you uh, want to break up the office manager to one in the back and one up, uh, in the, one of the front desk? I'd have an office manager in a practice like that. A single doctor practice, double doctor practice, it doesn't matter. She can have a position in the practice as well. Maybe she's, you know, check in and an office manager, but we need a go-to person. We need somebody who will take the guy, the doctor's vision and make it happen. Go to, let's get it going, keep it going. And, um, and then that kind of eliminate, it buffers the dentist from being, um, he gets the final say, but the petty stuff, the normal stuff, the systems questions, they don't go to him because he will uh, bend and, and break on all of those things. For me, I'm good with supervisors. I'm happy with supervisors. I'll take one up front and one in the back if that if I've got a doctor who's a little stronger, but he's very busy. I'll take supervisors. I can make those work. That's what you call them, back office supervisor, sure. front office supervisor? Absolutely. And what's the term for the front desk? If you call them receptionists, so they'll, they'll kill you. Um, yes. What, yeah, what, 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 what's, the, what's the politically correct? I call them administrative team, and I because they all do so much. I can't call them, you know, sometimes you hear people call them new patient coordinator, check out, check in. I, you know, if you ask me what I do for a living, oh, I'm the check-in girl. Nope. When I was uh, in those positions, I was ad I was administrator. I was an administrative assistant or administrator. And um, you can call me a schedule administrator. You can call me whatever you want, financial administrator. Or you can just call me a practice administrator. But I was considered the, an administrator. Everybody's got a politically correct term. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that one out. So you're, uh, you're involved with um, AADOM, American. Is it American Academy Dental Office Managers? Yes. Or is it American Association? American Academy. So, so what, what's they your... They let me in, Howard. What's that? They let me in. They let you in? Was it hard to get in? <laughs> Heck yeah, it's hard to get in. It's like a 20,000-page application. Is that right? I... Uh... I lectured for their group in, um, um, I think it was in San Diego last year or whatever. Okay. Just an amazing group. And it just, uh, I mean, just what, what, what I've always said a million times that, you know, you, you go to any lecture and half the rooms, just all single dentists sitting there. And right. those guys probably do 750 a year. And then the other half of the room, it's all each row is an entire dental office team. And those are all million dollar practices. Mm -hmm. And the dentist comes by himself to save money and they just don't get it. And, and what I liked about the um, AADOM meeting is most of those uh, office managers, they didn't even bring their dentist. They were, they, were, they were all there by themselves. They're like, they didn't want to waste their time babysitting their dentist. They wanted to go network with all these other office managers. And I mean, the conversations were, were just, just amazing. But it was more than uh, it was more than office managers. So two things: one, ADMC is the one with the twenty-page application. So the ADMC is the one that I had hard that I worked my butt off to get into. ADMC. It, yeah, that's the American Academy of uh, Dental Management Consultants. But the AADOM. Who runs that group? Uh, who all runs that group? It's got. Uh, is that the Linda Miles group? Uh, it you no, that's SCN. This one's got, I think, the president, Denise Cardello, and then vice president, Deborah Nash, this year. So it's a good group of people, but they're consultants. All right. So go back. AADOM, fantastic group. But do you notice that that group is now so much more than managers? It's team members because they're the ones, they're the ones who are going to come back and put it into play. And I love dentists, but they have a support team. If you go to the doctor, who do you talk to the most? You talk to the nurse. I mean, who do you call when you got a problem? You call your nurse. I can't even, I can barely remember my dentist's name sometimes or my medical doctor, but I know my nurse. 
that lady goes to church with me and I can ask her anything and she'll she's always so supportive of, of, of the doctor but same thing when you go to these conferences they're crazy awesome full of people who are hungry as heck and they want to learn and they want to put it into play so when we start talking about like even national meetings state meetings all these dental meetings when they are when they're talking about how they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and people aren't going to the organized education anymore i'm like that's because the stuff for the team is smaller and smaller and smaller if they would go and shake that tree a little different wouldn't we have a bigger uh, crowd and what was the aada oh that's the american academy of, that's the dental assistance association Oh, I like, thought it was the Arizona Automobile Dealers Association. Can I be in that? that that's uh, what came up on it. So what was it? It's, it was called the American what? Dental Assistant? The Dental Assistance Association. Yeah. Is that with uh, Tia? Yep, there you go. I need to get her on here and talk about that. I, I can't believe I I'm podcasting. I need to get her on there because... Are you she, friends with her? I am. You tell, tell, can you email her and tell her that? Oh, yeah. I'll... I'll Pimp you out to anybody you want to be pimped out to. You mentioned a couple of other technologies that uh, I want you to go back. You said um, Demand Force, Lighthouse, and what was the third one you said? Uh, we got Solution Reach, which is Smile Reminder. Okay, Solution Reach. We're, we're talking about digital accountability. You said Solution yeah. Reach, which is Smile Reminder uh, in Utah. And mm -hmm. you said um, Lighthouse and Demand Force. Go. How, is, how are these three? Talk about them and how they're part of your uh, um, digital accountability. Those are, you know, when you look at, um, when you're looking at confirmation calls, when you're looking at email requests, you're looking at a lot of transactions between patient communication back and forth. They have started to create and develop um, their own kind of call lists and things on there to let you know opportunity that's coming out. Smile Reminder, obviously, one I'm a little more familiar with because more of my practice have it when I walk in the door. And with them, now they'll be able to show you if your care credit's hooked to it. They can show you any care credit user. If, if you got a care credit card anywhere in the country, maybe you got it because you went to your vet, then if they're a patient in your practice, it'll show up that they have a care credit card. They didn't have to fill it out in your practice it'll show you that they have a care credit card. And so therefore I see opportunity, right? Mrs. Right, Jones right. has $5,000 of treatment left. I see here these dollar signs. I know that she has a care credit card, so I see my opportunity to get her uh, to utilize that care credit. That's money on the table, right? Right, right. So I love their level of accountability when things are missing. If you're, if you're signed up by text, but you don't get emails, it shows you, hey, missing this email, Real big opportunity here. For me, I like those types of accountability. Um, if we could, if we could get out there bigger, better, I love that program. But you just got to have the right internet for that. I want to switch. Wanna... I want to switch gears uh, completely. <laughs> I, I, I want to switch gears completely. We, we were talking about digital accountability, and that went off on there. When I'm on the message boards of Dental Town, um, one of the uh, most common things about uh, practice management is. Their overheads just keeps creeping up, creeping up, creeping up. Especially the older dentists who kind of got their cut their teeth with indemnity insurance, where they'd pay Delta and they just give them a percent. And now that's slowly switched to PPOs. Uh, Eighty-two percent of dentists say PPOs, and so many dentists say, "Man, you know, um, what should labor be? Uh, my my overhead every year, my overhead goes up higher and higher." Talk about staff wages. Talk about overhead. And so, when and when dentists call you up and you start looking at their metrics. What percent of the time is overhead a problem? Overhead's always a problem. Overhead's always a problem. It's always a problem. And, 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 and can you be more specific and um, what is the over, what, what kind of overhead do you like versus what are you seeing when they call you? And then if they're paying you on this program, 3,900, you come in for three days, then you see them, you go to their office uh, for two days every other month. What, what, is the, what is the treatment plan diagnosis overhead specifically and then what can you usually get it down to and how? Is that so, enough questions? That's See, a lot what of I do is I throw out 38 questions and hope you <laughs> think <laughs> one of them was good. Holly said, okay, the third one was a decent question. I'll let's, go with that. <laughs> let's do it. Okay, so for me, let's, I want to break that down for you. One, all dentists, most all dentists have uh, some type of overhead concerns. 
I don't want to say all because I have clients that are really in check. They call me and they're in check. They want to grow, man. They just want to blow it out of the water. So I don't want to speak and set and encompass all that into every client. Um, a lot of, 60% uh, of my clients are PPO. So I love insurance. I don't have a problem with it. It's a form of marketing. Uh, you, you know, if, if that's where you're at, I'm not going to throw you off of it and walk in the door and say, get rid of it. Um, if your goals, your personal goals are to start coming off of it, I will help you devise a plan to get off of it. I'm happy to do that. But if your goals are to keep it, hey, we'll devise a plan to make it work. For me, I want to keep my staff cost in that 20 to 24. Um, I'm not cutting wages. The only way we can keep it there is if we get our collections up. We have to make more money. Have to. There's no choice. So I and I and I talk like that to team members. Got to make more money. Out of control. And um, the reason I use that 20 to 24 is because I have practices that they do provide medical insurance to their team members or they do do 401ks. Um, when we start looking at that, I'm not going to roll in there and say, let's take all that away from them. They don't deserve it. We have to get that number to where it's, a to where it's sustainable. So however we've got to get um, their staff cost in check, we can, but that ultimately means we've got to make more money. So that 20 to 24% would include medical, 401k, uniform, yeah. you know, uh, FICA matching. Yep. And I want to remind my homies that when you're feeling like your overhead's too high because the guy sitting next to you at the study club says, oh, my labor is only 20%, 100% of the time that idiot has no idea what he's talking about. You say, well, does that include FICA matching? Oh, uh, what is FICA matching? Uh, right. you know, so, so don't believe any numbers you hear at the study club. Right. But, study clubs suck because they look at that 20 to 24% and they're like, oh, that's my payroll. That's yeah. my payroll. That's what they call that is, oh, just my payroll? Yep, I'm right there with you. They don't go, well, what about the lunches we buy them? Or, oh, you know, we buy uniforms four, ti four times a year. My girls, they like a new one every quarter. Um, they don't, not everybody encompasses that. So when you start putting that in there, then that's where um, we really got to get the number to well, change. What would you say the average labor is of someone calling you? They're calling you up and saying, Holly, I need, I need help. I went to... BryantConsultants.com, I need help. My, my overhead's too high. My labor's out of control. What, 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 is, what is the average? For someone okay. having an overhead concern, what is their average uh, uh, overhead? Most of them are sitting somewhere in the 28 to 30%. 28 to 30? Because they've, uh, they've done merit raises for years. They've, they're stuck in a rut. They don't know you how to explain what a merit raise is. That means I've been there. And every year I've been there, we walk in, we sit down, you buy me lunch, we talk about how good of a job I'm doing, and then you uh, throw out a number. I tell you it's not acceptable. And then you throw out a number number, and I say, fine, I'll take that until next year. That's entitlement, and that's merit raising. And look at entitlement. When you look at the United States government debt in 19 trillion, you look at the 55 trillion of unfunded liabilities, you notice all the people that pay taxes, we just get Social Security and Medicare. But everybody that works for the government, they get Social Security, Medicare, and a government pension. Because yeah. they had a special job at the post office and the IRS <laughs> and the CIA <laughs> and the Pentagon. And we're just dumbasses that they are... They had a special uh, clock-in job. What's that? They had a special clock-in job. You know, they could get rid of this entire deficit problem in an hour if they got rid of all the double-dipping entitlements for all the government oh. employees. You notice you don't work for the government and you get one dip. But if you work for the government, you get two dips. And the reason I point this out is because dentists are usually Republican and always bad mouth overhead and, and entitlements and all that. Yet they've got one of the most entitled industries in, in America. Yep. Well, for me, I, will, I walk into a practice and the majority of team members do not know the numbers. Because somewhere along the line, a lot of dentists were sitting into somebody's course. They said, oh, don't ever share what you're, you know, never share your overhead with them. And they don't know what it even takes to walk in and out the door with the lights on and off. Okay, they back, to, back to uh, dental intel. Is, is one of the things you want them to get every day their break-even point for the day? I mean, because dental offices overhead is pretty consistent. I mean, you go into most dental offices, they've had the same team members, the same players, the same rent, mortgage, equipment, build-out, computer, insurance. Uh, do you, do you, are you a fan of the morning huddle saying this is our break even point? Uh, we have to do this just to pay the bills today? I love it. I love it. But it, you know what? Mine's not about paying them 
paying the bills today. I do, we gotta, you know, here's what we gotta do. Here's our bottom line. Here's our bare ass minimal uh, for the month. So here's our BAM. And here's what we're working towards. Because when we set, um, I, I love bonus systems. I, they, I have one that I use. It's a modified Bill Blatchford program, but uh, I've modified it. That's why it's called modified. And uh, we have modified it to where it's built in. Um, it, it, in my book, it's error proof, uh, and no one's proved that it's got error in it yet. But it works for my team because I want them to set the goal. I want the doctor's break even to be built in his expense for his, 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 his expenses. If he's got to go on CE, he's got to take CE, it's built into the BAM. If lab costs are going up this year, build it in. If uh, he needs to, um, I don't know, take a mental vacation for a week, build in those days off so that it's there. If he needs a raise because he hasn't had one in 10 years, let's build it in. So that's my BAM is, my BAM is what is the budget? I kind of explain it to, to doctors like this. If you go to church and you look on the back of the bulletin, they tell you what the budget for the year is. And every time you put in offering, then they give you a new number, a new number. That's how we treat this. Here's the budget, guys. This is what we've built the practice on for, and forecast for the next year. That's exactly how I explain it. Now, we're going to break this down. I don't care if it's you get the month that's got more days or less days in it. We're going to break it down, and it's month by month. It's not the amount of days worked, it's the month. Because every year you get the same bills each month. Same quarterly bills come, same monthly bills come. So we break that down and we divide it out and we come up with the number we've got to have every month. And that number is our live by number. We live and we die by it every single day. We talk about it every day. And every day we don't only talk about how good we did, but we find our error. And I'm, I'm, I'm big on uh, accountability. I think that all of us have problems with accountability and it takes someone keeping us accountable and helping, holding us to our own goals and holding us to our own, I said it, I wrote it down, we're doing this. So I get the team on board to support that level of accountability and to show the doctors it can be done. So we talk about numbers daily and um, we talk about wins and the team comes up with wins. The doctor comes up wins. He has to get uncomfortable. And uh, we've got to know every day what we're missing, what we got to catch up on, and where we're going to put them. It's not just everybody talk about the number. If I need two more thousand dollars on my books today, then um, we're going to carve out the time to put that two thousand on the books. So we're going to find it. It may mean that uh, it's coming from hygiene and we're moving a direct patient, we're moving a patient over because the doctor has uh, relocated his lunchtime so that we can get this uh, tooth taken care of today. Or uh, if it means that um, we're going to double up towards the end of the day, we're going to do it. I want to ask you, where did you, uh, where did you cut your teeth to learn uh, bare ass minimum, the BAM number? Uh, that was uh, instead of the break even point. You and I must be two kindred spirits. Where did, where did you learn that as bare ass minimum? Well, it's bare ass minimum. Um, I, I, I guess I started hearing that um, when me. I guess I got that one from Jeff Blank. So bare ass minimum. What we got to do? We you know, gotta... it's funny because that's one of the reasons I went back to MBA school because my father had nine restaurants and taught me all business, but all of his terms had at least one profanity word. I mean, we went to mass every single morning, and he couldn't say one sentence without profanity. And I was sitting there thinking, uh, I need to go back to MBA school. And for the whole two years of MBA school. All I learned was everything my dad taught me without the profanity. And one of them was bare ass minimum to break even point. So what was Bill Blatchford's bonus system and how did you modify it to the modified? His, his system is based on a 16 day. Uh, if that's how many days you work, his is based on the actual days you work. And from what I, from the way I remember it. And for me, um, mine's the every, it's monthly payout. It's three months average together, but the payouts every month. And it's based on the month, not how many days you worked. So if you work 20 days or 10 days, it's still the same number. Because here's what I know. My checkbook, and this is how I explain it to the team members, my checkbook, whether I work, go to work 10 days or whether I go to work 16 days, still needs the same amount in it to pay my bills. Same thing happens with your doctor. So I want you to, I make them put a business hat on 
business hat on and I want them to think about their household and I said how do you operate at home how do you manage your money at home to get your bills paid at the end of the month it's well, a budget no it's not they, they just look at the US government you just keep borrowing every year every yeah. year every year you just have more debt than the year before well, and, uh, and, and, and that's the hard part is because I don't want a dentist. Uh, I'm, I'm walking around these practices and I see dentists with no plan. They're 55, 60 years old, and they don't, they don't have a plan. But uh, can I, I want to I pin your feet down back to overhead. Um, um, go through more. You talked about labor being 20 to 24, including uniforms, Medi-Cal, 401K, FICA matching, lunches, everything you spend on your team. But, go, but keep going down. What, what about the rest of the overhead? Well, I love this. This is, and I'm not a team basher. I'm, I'm a team member, but I tell my teams, reality check, that you are the most costly thing in the entire practice. That the first 20, 22% of what the practice makes is to pay you guys. That, that shocks the crap out of any team member. Is like, you're kidding me, right? I mean, that's a pretty big portion in, 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 when you think about it. Um, you go into lab bills. You know what? Everybody's doing their lab thing. You know, ten to twelve. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. We use more costly labs for certain things. Uh, some people are milling in the office. So there's what, all the newer variables that play into that. Let, let's stop right there. What do you think of a lot of dentists that their, uh, their silver bullet to fix their office is buying a hundred fifty thousand dollar CAD CAM machine? <laughs> so they can get another bill, right? Is that, uh, is that, does that usually make them money or cost them money or, or does, or what, 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 what do you think about in-house milling? I like in-house milling if you'll do it and you'll do it right. I do not believe a milling machine was made for a dentist to be a lab technician. So if the average dentist is making $500 an hour, then um, you're taking a pay deduction if you decide to be a lab technician. And what did your three amigos that you uh, cut your teeth with, Ross Nash, Jeff Blank, Brad Durham, what do you think they would tell a young dentist coming out of school about uh, CAD CAM? Um, Ross, I hear, just got a CEREC machine, but I think, uh, I don't know that he's in-house milling. I think he's using it for scanning for digital impressions. So, uh, Jeff, you know what? He's cutting them and sending them to the lab. Brad, he's cutting them and sending them to the lab. I think that man's cutting three, four full mouths a week. So, well, will you fix me up with those three? Of course, I will. I, I would. Uh, I, I would love that because I like to. Uh, this is dentistry uncensored, and you know the the uh, all the buzz at the conventions and and all everything they're reading is uh, one message, and I I want to give voice to the other people. So you're good with lab bills, ten to twelve. What about supplies? Uh, uh, my God, supplies are. It, it is so easy to get your supplies down. I mean, stick in the five, six percent, but you can get them in five. You can, you can buy it on the internet. You can uh, talk to your, I mean, nowadays, any of your reps, they will keep your business. We are in the business to do business. So they'll keep your business. But see, a dentist won't even, won't even do that because a social animal does wants to avoid confrontation because monkeys and dogs and cats, we all survive together, unlike a shark. A shark doesn't smile, kiss, hold hands, no, none of that stuff, because it doesn't need anyone. So, so these reps, so they come in, oh, my God, Holly, I love your hair. You look so gorgeous. Are those new earrings? Here's some donuts, you fat son of a gun. So, how, how are you, so now the homie's thinking, well, Holly, if I ask her to get my supplies down, then she's not going to be my friend. How, how do you coach a dentist right now? You're talking to thousands of dentists. How would you coach this dentist to have an uncomfortable conversation with their rep from Shine, Patterson, Benko, Burkhart? And, and how would you do it? Would you show them a printout? Would you? How? I would do, if you're my dentist, that you need to have total control. You're not willing to delegate that because uh, I have dentists who don't want to delegate. Then I would have that honest conversation with your supply rep and just say, I really, I really love doing business with you and I want to stay doing business with you. But over the years, our numbers have escalated, and I understand expenses are up, but I need you to take a look, and I need you to find us a way to save some money. And I know you're going to do that for us because you value our business. That's if you're that control guy. And if what do you think the supplies should be? When they're calling you up and they say concerns with the overhead, what is their supply percentage? And well, what I see docs who's got supplies at 8 9% because they've, right. never, they've never negotiated. They've never even really 
they've justified it as this. It's, it's a couple percent. That's how they justify it to me. It's just a couple percent. But got, you think it should be, what do you think it should be? You said five to six, but you said. I wouldn't go over six. But you can and, get it into five in, you can get into five pretty easily. Now, now I want to, now I want to tell you what the reps are telling me. They're telling me that they come in there and say, oh, I'll get it to five. But you and your hygienist and your assistant use three different kinds of gloves. Uh, you have four different kinds of bonding agents. You, and so then when they, so you, you got, you got a group practice, you got two or three done it. So, you know, that, that when they say, okay, here's what we need to do, that the dentist usually vetoes it. Well, and, the, and then it's like this. Everything in life has a consequence, right? Hey, I can get it to this, but let me show you what needs to happen. But let me show you the consequences of not getting it to this. And if you're okay with that, so if you're okay with um, using five or six different bonding agents and not taking advantage of the cost savings, that's completely up to you, but that number's not going to go down. Or we're going to have to find other areas. Maybe you get to keep your bonding agent, but we get a little bit more um, cooperative on what gloves we use. Because you know what it is. It's buying bulk. You go to Sam's Wholesale, you go to Costco, you get it bigger. Sometimes you get a better savings. You know, you buy it on Amazon, you put it on uh, subscribe and save, you, you save money. Because you, we know we're guaranteed to get that business. So I think there are ways, and oftentimes you got to get creative. And if you can't get creative there, then maybe you need to go to a catalog subscription. Because I've got some doctors who are like, screw it, I don't need a rep. But for me, the biggest number one objection that I get from a dentist is I'm afraid because what if my, they also do my equipment repair and what if some of my equipment goes down and I won't be on their priority list anymore. So, and what do you say I, that? about that, my rebuttal to that is um, those equipment and maintenance people at Sean or Patterson or Burkhart or Atlanta, any of those supply companies, they need your business too, right? They, we all are in the world of business. So we've created this huge thing in our head that says we won't get on their priority list or they won't service our equipment if I have them evaluate my supply budget. That doesn't make sense. Most people just want you to tell them the truth. And if you're scared to death and you're really thinking that they're going to leave, that, that, that you might need to leave them or something, just have a conversation. Okay, so you, you've talked about overhead, uh, labor, lab, supplies. Let's switch to total overhead. What do you think total overhead should be? What, what is it usually when they're calling you, and what do you think it's manageable for you to get them to? I've had doctors who have called me, and they're at 90% overhead. Right. Like, that's is that before or after alimony payments? Um, that would be, <laughs> eh, I would tell you some of them that's after, some of them that's before. I've got a dog walker right now who's making 10 grand a month. What's and a dog walker? Okay. Well, he calls that his alimony payments because all she does is walk dogs. And so, she makes 10 grand a month doing it. And what do you think? You don't uh, have a dog either, Howard. What do you think uh, overhead, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think overhead should be? I, I'll tell you what I'd like to get it to. I would really, my goal, I'm realistic. So if I can get it to 70, I'm going to be okay. If, if you can get someone from 90 to 70 or just any office to 70? If I, can get, if, I can get, if I can get a doctor from 90 to 70, I feel good. I mean, I just say that's 20%. Yeah. But what, 20% but what you, a million looks like. But what do you think uh, an average dental office, what type of overhead do you think they should shoot for? Um, I really would like to see you shoot for 57. Is that possible? 57, 62? You tell me if that's possible. Is it very possible? Minimal. I think it's out there and there's a lot of them out there, but it's still kind of a sketchy situation because you'll have doctors who, every doctor is this, here's the hard part that we're going to all fight and pull each other's teeth apart with, is doctors who are a single entity. So it's my practice, my cars, my car gets in my practice, so we pay my car, we pay my insurance through the practice, uh, all my kids' phones in the practice, I got my kids on payroll. Right. Yeah, but that's not that that that's bubblegum accounting. Yeah, all bubblegum accounting, but all of that is a shakedown. How do you shake it all down? Right now, I've got a pra I've got a practice trying to work on their partnership, and we're we've spent probably five months shaking stuff down, so we can find out what the true overhead of the practice is. Yeah.
Yeah, I know. Uh, and that's, that's why. Mystery about being a, a, a dentist, right? Yeah. I want to switch gears completely again. I, the hour's up. Can I take you into overtime? You can take me anywhere you want. You're, you're on vacation, right? Is this a vacation? Okay. okay, you're too damn good to let go at one hour. I want to keep going. I want, <laughs> I want to switch gears uh, uh, completely. Um, podcasts are big fans of, of younger people. There's, you know, all my, all my uh, older people I know, most of them have heard a podcast. They, they never listened to one. But a lot, of the, a lot of these kids you're talking to are, you know, under 30. And yeah. they're um, they're thinking about um, starting up their own office right now. They're right now. You're talking to thousands of young women dentists who are working in corporate chains, and they're like, "I kind of want to break out and go to my own," but it's it's scary. And it, it, the bottom line is just scary. Talk to that talk to that girl. What would be your best advice to someone commuting to work right now, and they work for an associate? Maybe it's a private, maybe it's a corporate, and they want to start their own business. Talk to that person right now. Um, I, I talk to that person at least two or three times a week because I'm a very open book. I'm I'm always happy for people to email me, call me, I give out my cell phone number a lot. Um, you never gave it to me. Is that because I'm old, short, fat, bald, and ugly? Yeah, I danced with you at the the Royal Health Gala, and you know you didn't ask for it, so I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, um, for me, it, it it it's a lot about finding the right place and the right connection. If if I was buying a practice right now. I would find uh, somebody had a, who had a um, giving heart that would self-finance, and I would hook up with a doctor who's in his mid-50s that would have a practice that I could go in, do a little, eh, do a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of work on over the next four or five years and own myself an empire. There are so many doctors out there who are over the age of 55 that do not have an exit strategy. And they don't know what to do with their practice. So those practices and those patients will either fizzle away. Um, they've let their practice go so bad it's hard to think about restarting it up. So they would also be very willing to get in cahoots with somebody who potentially had um, a building and new equipment that would take them in. I've seen it done so many ways. Um, so if I was a young kid and I was getting out of school, I would find myself someone who would who is willing to put a little time into me, teach me a few things, groom me a little bit, let me work on their patients and buy in and let them self finance it. That's my number one. And I'm I'm and I and I'm I'm a relationship person, but you find the right relationship. Right now I've got six practices that are being owner financed. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is um I don't think that's dead. But a lot of people say that that's risky and dead. I think that's um, relationship-based, and it's getting back to what we're good at. And, and, and you're giving a doctor a chance to fund his retirement because he doesn't have one. And you know what? What you just said was genius in so many ways. When I got out of school 30 years ago, the seller always financed. But then the big banks came in, and they, 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 they want that money. So they, they want to do the deal because when it closes, they all get big fat checks. But here's what I've seen the dark side of that is sellers sell dental offs to kids who can never take it over. They, they don't have the skill set. You know, the, the, they, they don't have the – maybe they were doing root canals and full mouths and all this stuff. The, the kid doesn't even know any of this stuff. They sell them this practice, and the kid bankrupts a year later. And when I got out of school, the owner would carry. When the owner carries – they have a total economic incentive to teach you the skills, to introduce you to patients, to talk good about you at church in the bowling alley, and they're they get they're they're incentivized. I I love the owner carry. I wish we'd go back to the owner carry. I wish all the dentists would just just you know say I only want to go in where the dentist self finances because then you say the dentist has got a seven year income stream, and 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 he's got every incentive to come by your office and say hey I just talked to Mary at Safeway. And she's upset about this, so I talked her into it. She's going to come back in. I'm going to meet her here tomorrow, you know, blah, blah, you know, whatever. But the owner carries everything. But I want you to back up even further because you didn't explain why you would um, go into an exist buy an existing instead of starting a scratch practice. Talk about that. So for me, buying something that's existing means that um, I'm walking in on day one and I have opportunity. Buying something that has nothing in it, I'm the opportunity. So <laughs> it's me, it's whatever, it's how many times am I standing on the side of the road with a sign 
What do I have enough soft cash for marketing? What is what am I going to put into it? And um, I, for a kid that's coming out of school, or maybe you've put in four or five years somewhere, and you've got your feet wet and you're ready for this adventure, then um, there's so many people out there right now. You know, Howard, I'm telling you, my biggest issue is I've got probably six, seven, eight, nine doctors that need associates. And I can't get an associate in their practice because some kids don't want to move. Oh, I'm from Chicago. I want to stay in Chicago. So they're going to sit there on their half a million dollars worth of debt. And they're going to work for corporate or they're going to wait for some crappy job to open because they don't want to relocate. Um, for when we do these uh, owner finances, I build in, um, I call it like face masking is the way I explain it. So if you, I don't know a lot about sports, but I, uh, I do know about face masking. You get penalized, right? If you're too aggressive. Are we in so hockey I, now? A little hockey. So okay. uh, there you go, hockey. So I build in a minimal and a max on how many days the associate has to work or per hours in a month. I also do that for the owner. That there's a minimum amount of days they have to work and a maximum during this transition time of the owner financing. Because tell me why you wouldn't want to just lay all that out there. Because all the fears that you're having in your head of, well, what if he just up one day and he decides, you know, he wants to get back in the saddle again and work some more because I built it back up. That, that's too aggressive. That's face masking. Whoa, wait a minute. There's a penalty for that. There's a cash penalty for that. You owe me money if you're going to come in here and be that aggressive. But you want it to be. I think there's just a happy medium for owner financing. But there's also an issue with kids uh, coming out of school that, they don't want to move or they are feeling a little entitled because they've got the DDS behind their name. And uh, the other part is, hey, corporate's done a great job at marketing the, you know what, out of them. They have marketed the crap out of those kids fourth year dental school and they feel entitled because that's what they were brainwashed during all those lunch and learns is you should be walking out on the street and this is what you should make day one for your two and a half hour filling. <laughs> so when you drill that when you drill that tooth down and that patient's sitting open for two and a half hours, then if it takes you two and a half hours to do it, buddy, it don't matter. You should be making this money. You know, so, all the corporate CEOs, you can uh, just Google their name and find them. They're all making these uh, statements that corporate dentistry will take over half the market. Some say within five years, some say within 10, but they all say that within five to 10 years, half the dentist will be Walgreens, CVC, uh, CVS dentist. Do you, do you believe that statement or not? Well, I'm an old soul at heart because of this. When I go back and I look at um, the world that we live in, there are corporate chains everywhere that have been there for years, but there are still niche stores, small community stores, mom and pop, local stores that are thriving. I think they'll always be that. Do I believe that it's going to be half? No. But do I believe that it's going to continue to rise? Yeah, but as we continue to rise, as they continue to rise, there are more and more people um, taking pride in that owner, single doctor practice. I own it myself. It's mine. I'm not under the corporate chain. I think that the big scare right now is the competitiveness of HIPAA, OSHA, not being compliant. Um, you know, private insurance companies doing audit, more and more audits now, um, more funds being passed down, and it scares some dentists because they um, maybe they don't want to be as educated, maybe they don't want to invest that much in their self to find to stay compliant, or they don't want to send somebody to be compliant. So, for me, I'm going to say it's not going to be half in my book. Uh, I, I'm going to keep my old soul mentality. I think the, you know, obviously the DSO is uh, growing and there are a lot of entrepreneur dentists out there that are trying to own more and more practices because they see that they're profitable. I, I, I think dentistry's mean as long as people are, you know, still drinking sodas and having crappy diets and doing uh, things they love, then, you know, there's always a need for teeth. It's I, us putting the value on them. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm not in a fancy suburb. Sure. And 10% of my patients bring a Coke or a Dr. Pepper yes. into the room. I mean, 64. they stop their cigarette at the door. Yeah, and I, I, I tell them in the opera, I say, do you take your bong to church? <laughs> 
You know, can we just leave the Dr. Pepper in the car? Hey, um, what if, you know, I know, I know what my homies are thinking. They're like, well, my situation's different. My, my, mine's all different special. I just want to talk to you. How can someone talk to you or contact you? What would be the best way? All right, we're going to play this game, right? So yeah. this is where you've asked me for my phone number, so I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to give it to all your homies. All right. So um, you can call me at any time as long as uh, you realize I'm on Eastern Standard Time, and for me, the normal hours of operation usually end about 10 o'clock. So <laughs> fair game. I give you after hours of work. But if you can't hit that my phone number by 10 o'clock, we've got a real problem. Um, 803-322-6020. One more Go time. 803-322-6020. And then Holly is H-O-L-L-I-E at Bryant Consultants with an S dot com. So that's Holly at Bryant Consultants dot com. You cannot remember any of that. Just uh, go to Google. No, I spoil my BryantConsultants.com. I spoil my podcast. I, I didn't. I when I basically everybody says to me, um, it's her commute to work, and the rural dentists actually have longer commutes in the inner city, if you can believe that. But what I do is we transcribe all of our notes. So on the podcast section, my spoiled listeners get to uh, they they don't have to, they don't have to stop their car and write anything down. They just know they go into dental town. And the entire transcript of this conversation is done. If they went to your website, BryantConsultants.com, uh, what are they going to find? Um, they're going to find information. I mean, we're getting ready. We're working on our YouTube channel right now to start putting out videos and stuff. We have trainings. I do dental assistant trainings because uh, that's where my roots are. I started there. So we make provisionals and teach photography and stuff. But they're going to find marketing. They're going to find... Um, they're going to find things to download. They're going to find other people's uh, testimonies of, of what we've done. And anybody that goes on my website, uh, if their testimonial's up, they absolutely uh, welcome somebody to call them and say, tell me about this crazy girl. I heard her on this podcast. I, 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 I want to know legitimate facts. And they're honest with the facts. My, um, I, I, I'm in it for the passion. I love doing this stuff. But, man, um, for me, success comes with time and money. My doctors want time and money. All right, They'll final question. I'm off and a lot more money. Final question. Who do you think's cuter, your four-year-old daughter, Scarlett, or my four-year-old granddaughter, Taylor Marie? Ah, I got blonde hair, blue eyes, and she talks like her mama. <laughs> You're the guy hosting the show, so oh, I'm going to take the humble path, and I'm going to say your granddaughter. You're, you're probably a... Uh, <laughs> The only girl not worried about my granddaughter because I, I always feel sorry for her because her grandpa and her, all of her uncles are boys. She's never done a girl activity yet. All of her activities are hunting, fishing, shotguns, camping. Do you think she'll – how old do you think she'll be before she realizes she's a girl? Well, I grew up tomboy, so uh, I realized that I was a girl when I was in high school. So yeah. I'll tell you in high school, she'll pick up the Barbie dolls. She'll pick up the boys. and um, You don't think and we're ruining her? No, you'll you'll have a problem with her because she'll uh, she'll turn on you. Oh, you won't my. know what to do with it. Then right she'll now. make up on Grandpa. All right. Well, hey, seriously, Holly, uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of yours. Uh, you're the real deal. And homies, my last thing, I'm just gonna beg you one more time. You're not. Don't do. Don't go to any institutes or buy any shiny objects till you get your house in order. <laughs> An institute and learning to place implants and learning sleep apnea and learning all this crap is not going to fix your business. Get your house in order. And once your house is in order and your place for growth, I get it that boys love toys. I got every toy known to man. But you should be able to buy those toys in cash. And you should buy them for fun and passion and excitement. I loved everything I've learned about sleep apnea. But I didn't go there thinking it was going to fix my practice, fix my overhead, and get my staff. You know, get your house in order. Call Holly. Everybody that's doing two to four million a year has been using consultants for decades. And everybody that wants to uh, uh, has burnout, depression, can't take any more. It's because they always try to fix their problems with a shiny object or an institute. Just get your damn house in order. And Holly, um, you're amazing. And thanks for getting so many of my homies' houses in order. Thank you. It was great having some fun with you, Howard. Have a rockin' hot day, Holly. Bye-bye.